Hi, I'm Kina, and this video is going to be about intergenerational trauma and family systems theory. So before I get started, I just wanted to put a couple disclaimers. The first is that a lot of theory about family systems and intergenerational trauma can be very helpful for people at a certain stage of trauma recovery, but it can also be something that can be too much too soon. So it looks at kind of establishing the different patterns that were passed down from our parents, from our grandparents, from different members of our family and their experiences. And if you're at a stage where you just need to focus on yourself and your own recovery, your own experiences, that is 100% valid. So this is not necessarily uh, something that is helpful for everyone at every stage, but I do think it is very helpful information for people at some point a lot of the time. So one reason I'm saying that is because when you're working on recovery, depending on your family background, if you were someone who experienced profound abuse or neglect or abandonment, a lot of times there's kind of a cultural narrative of rushing people towards forgiveness, like you need to forgive to heal. And although I think forgiveness and having compassion for where our family members were coming from can be a helpful step for a lot of people depending on their experiences, it's not something that can happen before you experience a genuine environment where you're able to grieve, feel anger, and process what your experiences meant to you and how they impacted you. So that is the right of every single person who's healing from childhood trauma and if it feels like it's focusing too much on other people and their trauma to kind of look at this piece, you don't have to do it yet. So I, I just wanted to like make that clear because I think that is an issue sometimes kind of rushing people to forgive before they've really established the meaning of their experiences and uh, felt empowered to express what impact that had. So to define what family systems theory is, family systems theory basically looks at the way that families function as a whole and the kind of different dynamics, relationships, rules, structures, and contexts that kind of create that family functioning. And what I like about family systems theory is that it doesn't just look at people in this kind of hyper individualistic way. It takes it takes account of the fact that children are not really dysfunctioning as isolated individuals they're functioning as a member of a family and we're social creatures in general so our development is not just based on our own individual experiences but kind of the structure of the environment and the family that we grew up in so when applying family systems theory to children one of the things that that looks like is if a kid for example is showing like difficulty in school or anxiety or other mental health issues you wouldn't just look at that kid and say okay what medication do they need to be on you know what what do they need to do differently you would actually be asking questions about that kid's environment and understanding like what are the relationship structures looking like what are the environmental influences looking like and kind of seeing this kid's symptoms as a manifestation of larger structural environmental issues so i really love that because it's a little bit less of pathologizing individuals and more of understanding people as a product of their environment and kind of looking at that nurture piece of mental health so that's how you would apply family system theory when working with a child. If you're an adult and you're not working on a family altogether, family systems theory is essentially just a really great tool to understand your family, <clears throat> your upbringing, and the dynamics of your family and kind of what that taught you. So if you research family systems theory, you can read a lot about it and it talks about a lot of different things that I think people have experienced but maybe don't always have the terminology or, or definition or permission to kind of talk about. So. Some of the things family system theory looks at are things like boundaries, enmeshment, <clears throat> you know, what are, what are the boundaries in the family, how are the relationships connected, and is there kind of a culture of codependency, are the children encouraged to differentiate from the parents and become their own people and find their own identities, or are there kind of family expectations to fulfill certain roles based on kind of the parents' identities and emotions. Um, it looks at things like alliances and coalitions so sometimes in family structures there will be certain members of the family that are kind of allied together or on a team sometimes against other members of the family and it also looks at like different family roles that can be assigned to people such as like a scapegoat role where there might be one kid in the family who's kind of the problem child who's the one that kind of acts out and gets the most attention but family systems theory wouldn't look at that and say oh like this kid is acting out and needs to be dealt with it would look at actually that kid's behavior as kind of 
the external manifestation of larger family dysfunction and this kid's behavior is just kind of the most visible tip of the iceberg but there's all this other stuff that involves every member of the family that's kind of informing that so when you when you look at it as an adult it can be a kind of good way to understand your family and the messages that you learned and kind of the relationship and communication patterns you learned from the way that your family system was set up family systems theory also talks about things like secrets <clears throat> secrets and rules and that can be a helpful framework for exploring especially families that have kind of hidden or repressed trauma um really common family secrets are like a family agreement to not acknowledge abuse to not acknowledge neglect or to not acknowledge like addiction or certain families mental health problems these are family secrets where there's kind of like a silent pact to just not talk about it and then there's also rules which a lot of the times these rules are not talked about and not kind of verbally expressed or established but everyone in the family knows them and these are rules that involve things like how people express their emotions how they communicate maybe how one family member is treated or responded to so family rules and secrets are often things that people don't talk about they're not verbalized but they still majorly impact someone's experience in the family so family systems theory can kind of help you put a name to some of the dysfunctional dynamics that you might have experienced in your family and not really had the space to talk about or acknowledge before. So when you tie in intergenerational trauma, intergenerational trauma is based on the idea that just like culture and traditions can be passed down through a family, pain, dysfunction, and trauma can also be passed down through a family. And this happens in a number of ways. The first way is on a genetic and physical level. So if you research something called epigenetic trauma, there's research surrounding the way that major traumatic experiences actually change a generation and an individual's DNA. And on a genetic level, that trauma is passed down to their children. So there's, there's a physical scientific level that that happens on that's really interesting and that there is starting to be a little bit more research on. And then the other way that trauma gets passed on is through relationship patterns, behavioral dynamics, family dysfunction dynamics, and kind of uh, ways that are related to the direct experiences of how someone is raised and the, the kind of early life experiences that they have. So... One story that I really like that kind of highlights the idea of intergenerational trauma is by Gabriel Mate, and he's someone I reference a lot because he's a really incredible researcher and writer who focuses on trauma and compassion in treatment of trauma. But he is a Jewish man who survived the Holocaust as an infant, and he has written extensively about his personal experiences with intergenerational trauma from being a Holocaust survivor, not at an age that he can actually consciously remember, but that still has impacted him in, in, in quite a few ways that he's identified. So I'm going to just kind of summarize that story, and I recommend you looking up him talking about it if you're interested, because he's amazing. But he basically says that when he was born... And actually, I'll go back before he was born. We know now that babies are also impacted by the environment that their mother is in and the way that their mother feels and is experiencing life when she's pregnant with that baby. So if you are in like a toxic environment, a fearful environment um, for Gaber Mate, his mom being in an environment where she was actively terrified for her life and the life of her family under a Nazi regime, that impacts her on a biological level that also impacts uh, any baby that she's having on a biological level. And that's kind of the physical piece of epigenetic trauma. And then on a more behavioral level, uh, you had an entire generation around the time, like right after the Holocaust, of babies who had not directly experienced the trauma of the Holocaust, like they had not been targeted with it, had not been alive during it, but were showing all of these, now we understand trauma responses, um, all of these babies who were crying, who were having medical issues and health issues, who were colicky and kind of dysregulated. And, you know, we now know that that was this impact of like epigenetic trauma and all of these babies being born from a generation of mothers who had either who had been you know actually actively traumatized by the holocaust and had also had their babies you know often in an environment of severe stress and distress so 
Gaber Mate uh, and his mother eventually escaped the Holocaust and he ended up growing up in Vancouver, BC, which is, I believe, where he still practices as a doctor. And he says that some of the main messages that he received from those early experiences was a feeling of not being wanted. And this was a overwhelmingly kind of cultural and political message at at the time with there literally being, you know, genocide oriented towards him and his people so a sense of not being wanted on a very broad scale and then I I would imagine also maybe a sense of not being wanted from being disconnected with his mother or other members of his family because all the adults in his life were extremely traumatized and extremely preoccupied with survival and when you're really preoccupied with survival you can't focus on connection so he talks about you know getting this message growing up that he wasn't wanted and he ended up becoming a doctor and he says that for him this was a coping skill because what do you do if you're not wanted you find a way to be needed and that for him being a doctor fulfilled this kind of wound of feeling like he wasn't wanted because he felt important and felt that he was needed and so he ended up getting married and having kids and became as he describes a workaholic and I really appreciate his stories because, um, you know, workaholism and becoming a doctor are what most people would kind of consider positive coping skills, right? Like that's not the same as uh, getting addicted to drugs in, in most people's eyes and is more productive in the sense that he was helping people and not necessarily harming himself on an obvious level. But he really reflects on the fact that for him, you know, workaholism, perfectionism, and kind of trying to achieve greatness in this way was a similar escape and kind of coping and numbing tool for these like wounds of feeling unwanted and alienated and and disconnected from this kind of early trauma in his life and from his family ancestry so he had kids and he was extremely wrapped up in his work he was working like really long hours and when he wasn't working he was writing books and doing research and he had this moment of awakening where he looked at one of his kids and realized that his children were feeling unwanted and that this kind of sense of being unwanted had been inadvertently passed down from him to his children even though their lives were so different than his life and his life was so different than his mom's life and yet this kind of sense of being unwanted and maybe disconnected from parents had been passed down through multiple generations now and yeah I just always love that example because I think it's such an example of someone who is trying to do their best for themselves and their children but those kind of unmended early wounds are still manifesting in these really interesting ways and being passed down from parent to child so intergenerational trauma can look so many different ways for different families it can be really obvious like when you have the same kind of abuse passed down like you have generation after generation that use Uh, abusive physical discipline practices and believe that's normal and pass that down and then there's a lot of really kind of complex and more nuanced ways that intergenerational trauma patterns can be passed down and kind of transformed and mutated over time but still passed down in their own way One tool that I recommend if you're interested in looking into this is called the genogram. So you can do this on paper or you can also use some websites to make your own genogram. But the genogram is essentially looking at a family tree and instead of just writing about, for example, breast cancer or heart disease or different like physical health problems that might have been passed down through your family tree, the purpose of the genogram is to look at traumatic experiences, relationship dynamics, and kind of influential structures that were passed down through the family tree. So if you use one of the online tools, they have kind of recommended codes that you can fill in, but you can also just label it yourself with whatever you think is significant. And I also want to acknowledge that this can be something that is challenging for people who were adopted or who maybe are not in touch with their biological family. But uh, the genogram and family systems therapy can actually relate to either the family you were raised in or your biological family or both. Um, it, It can kind of be used in whatever way is most relevant for you. But I also know that kind of depending on people's family history, sometimes they don't really know much of their family tree. There's alienation and that can make this challenging. But to whatever degree is possible, The idea of the genogram is to go as far as you can back through the different siblings and parents and generations and you you mark down different patterns things like divorce neglect addiction depression codependency um was this relationship abusive was it enmeshed was it distanced and cold you know what are the kind of different relationship dynamics and patterns that have been passed down 
and that this is an exercise that a therapist can help you do or you can also try to do it by yourself but for a lot of people it's really eye-opening um, and you might notice some patterns go back further than you thought they did or kind of come from places that you hadn't been aware of before. I'm gonna play a clip of a movie I saw that I thought was really an incredible representation of intergenerational trauma and someone working through intergenerational trauma. It's from the movie Honey Boy, uh, which features Shia LaBeouf, and it opens with this scene of him in rehab and being diagnosed with PTSD and asking from what? And the movie is basically answering this question of what his trauma is from. And what I thought was so intense and amazing about the movie was that the movie really features his relationship with his father when he was a child star and he plays his own father in the movie. So it's him playing his dad and then a different kid plays him as a child and the movie is kind of an exploration of their relationship and the way that the father's trauma and pain impacted Shia LaBeouf and kind of his journey in processing that so he could be free from it and kind of make his own story instead of uh, following in his dad's shoes. So I'm going to play a clip of that. favor by paying you to be my chaperone. Give me a fucking cigarette, Dad. Whoa, you're doing who a favor? You, who else is gonna give a felon a job? I'm not stupid. I don't need you to do that. <laughs> what are your sets now? I don't fucking know! I don't fucking number! <laughs> What's the fucking point of doing this? What's the fucking point of putting a number to it if it's- So we can track progress. Well, for fucking who? For fucking who? If it, if it works, I'm gonna know, won't I? For court. Avi. Let's bring it down. Oh my God. Cactus, window, carpet, pen. One more. You're a ridiculous person, you know that, right? You think you're fucking smart because you got me to act for you? I've been doing this shit my whole fucking life for a living. I would know if it works. This is all bullshit. How am I supposed to have therapy with my probation officer? Name one more thing. You. The only thing my father gave me that was of any value is pain. And you want to take that away? Can I? So if anyone wants a movie recommendation, I really, really recommend this movie. And it made me cry like six times when I saw it in theater. I think it's really well done and a really good look at these kinds of things. Another thing that I wanted to mention is that for a lot of people, when they are really confronted with working through intergenerational trauma is when they have kids. Because for a lot of us, we kind of lack perspective on what we experience as children until we're adults and until we're presented with children who were the age that we were when we had certain traumatic experiences. So for a lot of people with CPTSD who experience childhood abuse or neglect, it feels normal to a certain extent. and. Uh, we become kind of desensitized to our own experiences. But a lot of times when people become parents, it can be very triggering and evocative of these kind of things coming up in a, in a certain way because a parent may be looking at their child and thinking, wow, when I was that age, I was, you know, walking to school by myself or making all my own meals or that's when this thing happened or that's when I felt this way. And they're kind of looking at their kid and seeing how young and innocent their child is and it's giving them this kind of awakening as to the loss that they experienced and the kind of loss of childhood that they experienced. So it can simultaneously be an opportunity for grieving, but also something that's really triggering and brings up a lot of painful memories for people. 
parents are also put in a situation where they have to figure out how to meet their kids needs and respond to their children's emotional distress and if this is something that you didn't experience growing up you didn't have someone who accepted your emotions and helped you emotionally regulate and could respond to your distress compassionately trying to give your child that kind of love and comfort and kindness and safety can be triggering to the parts of you that didn't receive that and can bring up memories of being kind of emotionally abandoned or mistreated as a child and especially if you had kind of significant or severe experiences of abandonment, loss, or abuse, when your child gets to the age where you experience those things, that can bring up a lot of those memories as well. So parenting is something that's really challenging for people with trauma, but is also kind of the pinnacle of an opportunity to break intergenerational trauma patterns. And I've also heard from a lot of people about how empowering and healing it can be to actually be able to give your kids what you didn't receive as a child but I think the the important part is that while you're giving your children those things that you didn't receive if this is something you're experiencing that you're also finding ways to give yourself those things and to give your own inner child those things and I think that's how it can be a healing process is as you're kind of seeing your kids as these like innocent good children who are deserving of love and safety and protection that you can also be using that as a mirror to realize that that was you too and that the things that happened to you weren't your fault and that you can now give yourself that kind of safety and compassion that your children deserve and that you also deserve and I've heard and read some really inspiring stories from people talking about how healing it was for them and and their own kind of trauma recovery to be able to know they're breaking those cycles with their children and not repeating those patterns of abuse and loneliness and alienation and shame that had been passed down generation to generation before them. Thank you for listening. I hope this all made sense and has provided a little bit of insight into family systems theory, intergenerational trauma, and kind of what that can look like in a CPTSD recovery context. There's a lot of really awesome other resources out there for learning more about it if you're interested. And yeah, thank you guys for watching.